Dr. Belkin is now going to introduce our next speaker. As you can see, our sponsors are on the slide and I just wanna say thank you again to our sponsors. They disappeared. <laughs> um, let me tell you a little bit. I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Belkin for being with us and all the support that he gives to Yoga Moves MS and the mind how much support the mind we've been work, we've been partners in helping improve the quality of life for people with MS for quite a while. We, he was an honoree for Yoga Moves MS, and I feel blessed, and the MS community is blessed to have you um, in our backyard in Michigan. Um, and I'm very excited to hear our next speaker, which I'm going to let you introduce, Dr. Belkin. Great. Thanks so much, Mindy. So yes, I have the pleasure and honor of introducing uh, Taylor Ganyu. Um, so Dr. Ganyu is going to be presenting um, about current research with Epstein-Barr virus and multiple sclerosis. Uh, so Dr. Ganyu, she is a uh, graduate of Michigan State University's College of Osteopathic Medicine, where she graduated at the top of her class. She completed her neurology residency through the Beaumont Health System and Michigan State University's statewide campus system. During her neurology training, she developed a sincere interest and passion for helping patients with the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and related disorders. She's therefore made the decision to ded dedicate her career to helping patients with multiple sclerosis, both from a clinical as well as a research perspective. She's currently completing her fellowship in multiple sclerosis at the Michigan Institute for Neurological Disorders Comprehensive MS Center. And I have the distinct honor and pleasure of being her fellowship director and getting to work with her on a daily basis. So, Dr. Ganyu. Well, thank you, Dr. Belkin, for the introduction. So I'm giving my presentation on the current research on the Epstein-Barr virus as it relates to MS. Um, so the objectives today, we're going to talk about what Epstein-Barr virus is. Um, we'll discuss the evidence, review the study itself, talk about what it means, and then how it still leaves us with some unanswered questions. And I'm just going to say in advance, some of my slides do have a lot of detail. Um, it's just for your information to review later, but I'll try to go through more of an overview um, and keep it as straightforward as possible with hopefully some time for questions at the end. All right, so to start, what is Epstein-Barr virus? It's actually a human herpes virus, and it infects about 95% of adults. Um, so even though it affects about 95% of adults, Still only a tiny fraction of those people will go on to develop MS. After infection, it does persist in kind of like a sleeping form in the B cells. And B cells are a part of our white blood cells that make antibodies. Um, so it kind of persists in those memory B cells. It's transmitted via saliva. Um, and then Epstein-Barr can kind of present a lot of different ways. So some people might have minimal symptoms, but it can also present as mono, which I'm sure many of us have heard of or been infected with. Um, mono symptoms can include fatigue, um, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes, um, swollen tonsils, and in some patients, they'll even get um, a swollen liver or spleen. All right, so what evidence do we have to support Epstein-Barr as the link to MS? Um, so a causal role is supported by the increased MS risk after mono. Um, you'll also get elevated blood antibody levels against these antigens for the virus. And then lastly, they did do um, autopsies on some patients with MS and they um, took samples of the demyelinating lesions in the brain. And they actually found that some of these lesions tested positive for the virus. Um, so now let's talk about this study. So the study was titled Longitudinal analysis reveals high prevalence of Epstein-Barr virus associated with MS. So in this study, there were 10 million young adults on active duty in the U.S. military, and 955 of them were diagnosed with MS during their period of service. They found that the risk of MS increased 32 times after being infected with Epstein-Barr virus. They also checked levels of serum neurofilament light chain. That's basically a big word, but it's a blood test um, that kind of checks MS disease activity. And they found that this um, blood test was only increased after, um, after somebody turned from negative to positive for the Epstein-Barr virus. 
Um, these findings suggest that Epstein-Barr virus is a leading cause of MS. And at the minimum, it tells us that Epstein-Barr is a necessity or is a necessary event um, to develop MS, which is pretty remarkable data and kind of the first time we've ever seen anything like this. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the cohort. Um, so for help, the research team um, turned to the U.S. military, um, where the the U.S. military collects regular blood samples. So they check um, people every six months for HIV screening. Um, so the research, the researchers were actually able to go back and use those blood samples. And if you think about that, so 10 million individuals getting blood tests every 60 or every six months, that's going to translate to over 62 million blood samples that they had to analyze. Um, in the end, it did take two decades before they had enough data um, to kind of run a statistical analysis. Um, so the study ran from 1993 to 2013. Um, I know the slides here, the pictures are um, a lot going on, but basically it's just to show you that there is a racially diverse population um, of individuals. Um, there were more men than women in the study. And as we know, MS is a more female predominant disease, um, about 70% female, but nonetheless, they did have at least 32% uh, percent female of the MS patients. Um, and then about 5.3% of these individuals were negative for the virus at the time of the first sample. I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but when you have 10 million individuals, that does translate into hundreds of thousands of young adults. Um, so now let's talk about um, the sampling itself. Um, so like I said earlier, they took patients and tested them for Epstein-Barr. So 800, there were 801 MS patients and 1,566 controls. One of the 801 MS cases occurred in an individual who was negative for the virus at their last sample. And at baseline, there were 35 MS cases and 107 of the controls that were negative for the virus. However, all but the one mentioned above did test positive for the virus before the onset of MS. And then the average time from the first positive sample to the, uh, to the onset of MS symptoms was about five years. Um, I'm not sure if it's easy or difficult to see this graph, but basically what I was trying to show is that they also checked um, another virus called CMV. And this virus is similar to Epstein-Barr. They're both human herpes viruses. They're both transmitted via saliva. So they checked both of the viruses and then looked at um, risk of MS. So you'll see the blue and the green really separate with the Epstein-Barr, meaning they definitely showed the increased risk, but you really don't see that with CMV. And same thing, if you look down at the orange dots below, you can see that there really was no increased risk of MS with CMV. Um, so how do we know that this is true of Epstein-Barr and not other viruses? So they actually tested over 200 other viruses to determine if MS could be related to dysfunction of the immune system from any virus, or if another specific virus would elicit that same response that Epstein-Barr does. And as you can see by that orange line, you see that significant increase with Epstein-Barr that you don't see with any other virus that they tested, which again suggests that Epstein-Barr virus is a cause of MS. So now we're going to talk about, again, those serum neurofilament light chain levels. So again, that's a blood test um, that's reasonably accepted as a biomarker that represents MS activity. So that means that if you have high NFL levels, then you likely also have high MS disease activity. So they found that this, um, these levels increase as early as six years before symptoms of MS. And then in patients who were EBV negative at baseline, and went on to develop MS, those levels were similar to those of non-MS controls, um, meaning there were no signs of you know, MS activity prior to testing positive for Epstein-Barr virus. And you can kind of see that um, in this graph again, if you're able to see it, the green being MS, the blue being not, and seeing that um, the increase really came um, with MS. Um, so this does indicate that EBV per, um, infection preceded not only symptom onset, but also the time of the first detectable pathologic mechanisms underlying MS. Okay, so how do we know that Epstein-Barr virus leads to MS and not the other way around? Um, this slide is really wordy, but I'm going to try to summarize it the best I can. 
Um, so basically to explain a 32 times risk for Epstein-Barr virus, it's almost impossible for there to be an alternate explanation. You'd need something that would confer at least a 60 times increased risk um, of MS. And at this point, um, there, the existence of an unknown factor that could increase the risk of both Epstein-Barr and MS by 60 times or more than 60 times is unlikely. Um, there are no good candidates or even hypothetical candidates that could increase the risk that much. Um, so based on this data, um, it's conclusive that Epstein-Barr virus is, again, a necessary event to go on to develop MS. As I mentioned earlier about that one case, which I'm assuming you're all wondering about, so the one case that was negative for the virus at the last sample was obtained three months um, before the onset of MS. So the question is, could this potentially suggest that Epstein-Barr was not the cause? Um, it could, unless um, we think a little deeper. So um, number one is, you know, did this person get infected after the last sample was drawn? Like I said, it was three months prior. So did their infection come after that? number one, or number two, did they fail to test positive, meaning they were still exposed to the virus, but that, um, you know, that blood test just didn't show that positive result. Or three, is there a chance that this patient could have been misdiagnosed with MS, meaning that um, they had something else that was, you know, similar, kind of looked like MS, but wasn't MS. Um, I think those are all really good questions, though obviously we don't have answers to them at this time. Nonetheless, I would say that the stream, extremely low risk, uh, MS risk in an EBV negative individual suggests that most MS cases are caused by Epstein-Barr virus, um, which raises the thought, could these potentially um, be prevented by a suitable vaccine? So what questions are still left unanswered? So like I just said, I think that one um, question, you know, most of these things are being studied, but one question is, will vaccination against Epstein-Barr virus prevent MS or could it potentially reduce the incidence of MS or change the course of the disease? Um, I think that's a question we still don't have the answer to, but that uh, hopefully there's research coming. Um, the next question is, if we treat mono with antiviral medications against the you know, virus itself, could that potentially you know, reduce the incidence of MS? Or again, could it alter the course of MS in any way? And then another unanswered question um, that I think we still have is, will treating MS um, with uh, disease-modifying therapy that targets um, the virus, could that potentially alter the course um, of MS as well? So I think most of these things, you know, they're starting to study and really look into, but I, I don't think that we necessarily have um, definitive answers for any of this yet. Um, so before I go on to questions, I just wanna, you know, kind of summarize and reiterate. Um, so, you know, I did say that about 95% of patients have been infected with the Epstein-Barr virus, but I just want to say again, only a tiny fraction of these patients do go on to develop MS. So just because, you know, you or a friend develop Epstein-Barr virus or mono, that does not mean that you're going to go on to develop MS. Um, however, on the other side, it does seem that based on, you know, this paper and this data that we reviewed, that Epstein-Barr virus is a necessary event to go on to develop MS. Um, so I think that's all I have. Um, if there are time for questions, I can do my best to try and answer them. Thank you, Dr. Ganyu. There are a few. One okay. is, I had infectious mono when I was 15. My MS symptoms didn't start until I was about 56, diagnosed at 58, is this normal? Um, so I, I don't know that I can entirely answer that. So I will do my best. Um, but my understanding is there's not one specific time that leads to MS or that is, um, you know, time from diagnosis and time to MS. From this paper, they just said the average time was about five years from the last blood sample to testing positive. Um, but based on this paper, that's kind of the only information I have to try to answer that question. Thank you. 
Next question. I'm a father with MS since 1998, and my daughter has tested positive for mono at age nine. In parentheses, she wasn't <laughs> anyone. Will she definitely develop MS? Um, no. Nope. So just because you have MS or a family member has MS um, and then you develop mono, that absolutely does not mean that she will go on to develop MS. Even though, you know, 95%, 95% of adults have had MS um, and, you know, most of us do not or have had not MS, sorry, have had Epstein-Barr virus, um, but most of us still don't have MS. So that does not mean that she will get it. No. But could it? Is there a correlation? Um, you know, I don't have a, ever have a crystal ball to know, you know, obviously um, we, this paper shows that EBV potentially increases risk for MS, um, but it doesn't mean that she would get it. But again, 95% of us have had MS or have had Epstein-Barr virus and not nearly that high percent develop MS. I, it's, this is related. I have MS and my daughter has had mono. What does she have to do to avoid developing MS? Um, so, so far, there's nothing specific that I know of that we can, you know, do once we've had mono to prevent MS from developing. Um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of things that they're researching and if they find something, you know, that potentially changes the viral course, I'm sure it will be in the news and many of us will know, but right now there's nothing specific that I know of. Hey, let's see. I, if daughter had EBV passed, I have a, should we test for SNFLs, neurofilament like chain? Um, so that's kind of a biomarker that it's reasonably accepted, but it's not something that is necessarily easy to routinely test for. Um, so I, I, I don't know that I have an answer to that either. Sorry. I would say that, you, you know, know what, it's good to say that you yeah. don't have the answer yet. Yeah. We don't, don't have all the they answer. Didn't, why did they give you a crystal ball when you graduated? I, I wish I had one. <laughs> did they tell you they were going to? <laughs> I wish. If over 90% of people have the Epstein-Barr virus, why is it considered a cause of MS? So because when they tested, you know, patients that did not have Epstein-Barr and those that did, they found that um, in order to have MS, it was almost a necessity to have tested positive for the virus. Okay. What is the test for Epstein-Barr? Do you mean treating MS with DMD will treat the Epstein-Barr virus? Um, so the test for Epstein-Barr virus is a blood test. And then the disease modifying therapies that we have now do target the immune system or, you know, many of them do. So potentially maybe some of those could be working by modifying, um, you know, the immune system and potentially there after modifying Epstein-Barr. I don't think that we have an answer to that yet. They are studying disease modifying therapies now that, you know, target more Epstein-Barr virus. And um, we're waiting to see the data to see how that affects MS. Okay. What do you think is a credible online resource to find future information? Um, I think the MS Society always has good information. And then um, there is something called PubMed where journal article articles are published. Some of them are a little bit complex, but it, nonetheless, it's a way that the real-time data is posted. Okay. I see. I missed one other one. Can a fresh herpes outbreak trigger an MS episode? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, you can get pseudo relapses, you know, anytime you have infection, um, but I'm not sure about herpes leading to an MS episode. All right. I think that's it um, related to the Epstein-Barr questions. Okay. Oh, wait, here's one other one. Last one, last one, I promise. Okay. For those who went to develop MS, did the research... Researchers also investigate any other factors or conditions that people had in common. Um, they looked at um, all the other viruses, but I think this, the data here that was basically blood tests looking at viruses and the neurofilamentary chain levels. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you for sharing. This is obviously an area of much interest. So thank you so much for sharing thank your time. Of course. Thank you so much.